again. If everybody can please take their seats, we get the door closed. Excuse me, we're going to begin if we could please take your seats and we can get the door closed, that'd be great. Okay. Close the door. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We're ready. Yep. So we'll do go ahead and do roll call. Commissioner Kern? Here. Commissioner Pavley? Here. Commissioner Kelly? Here. Commissioner Caliendo? Here. Commissioner Scarborough? Here. Commissioner Burke? Here. Commissioner Brumfeld? Commissioner Beatty? Here. Commissioner Sowards? Here. Ms. Coyle? Okay. Start with our opening prayer, please. We stand. Lord, we ask your guidance today as we consider matters that will affect the safety and welfare of many people in our county. Help us to listen with open minds to matters that are important before us and to act on the matters that will benefit those who reside in our area. Keep our minds open and alert, our hearts compassionate, and our comments charitable. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right. We have a full house, so if we could just uh, just, be, just be mindful, all right, of the sound so that we can hear everybody as we proceed. Thank you. The Zoning Commission of Palm Beach County has convened at 9 a.m. in the Vista Center, Ken Rogers Hearing Room, BC 1W 47, 2300 North Drog Road, West Palm Beach, Florida, to consider applications for official zoning map amendments, plan developments, conditional uses, development order amendments, type 2 variances, and other actions permitted by the Palm Beach County Unified Land Development Code, and to hear the recommendations of staff on these matters. The Commission takes final action regarding Class B conditional uses, subdivision variances, and Type 2 variances, and issues advisory recommendations on accepting, rejecting, or modifying the recommendations of staff regarding other requests. The Board of County Commissioners of Palm Beach County will conduct a public hearing at 301 North Olive Avenue, West Palm Beach, Florida, in the Jane M. Thompson Memorial Chambers, 6th floor, at 9.30 a.m. on Monday, November the 28th, 2022 to take final action on the applications listed below regarding official zoning map amendments rezoning class a conditional uses requested uses plan developments development order amendments waiver requests and administrative inquiries zoning hearings are quasi judicial in nature and must be conducted to afford all parties due process the Board of County Commissioners has adopted procedures for conduct of quasi-judicial hearings to govern the conduct of such proceedings. The procedures include the following requirements. Any communication with commissioners which occurs outside the public hearing must be fully disclosed to the hearing. Applicants and persons attending the hearing may question commissioners regarding their disclosures. Such questions shall be limited solely to disclosures made at the hearing or the written communications made a part of the record of the hearing. Any person representing a group or organization must provide documentation that the person representing the group has the actual authority to do so regarding a matter before the commission. Any person who wishes to speak at the hearing will be sworn in and may be subject to cross-examination. The applicant and county staff may cross-examine witnesses. Any other persons attending the hearing may submit cross-examination questions, including follow-up questions, to the chair who will conduct the examination. The scope of cross-examination is limited to the facts alleged by the witness in relation to the application. Public comment is encouraged and all relevant information should be presented to the Commission in order that a fair and appropriate decision can be made. Do we have proof of publication? Yes, Madam Chair. May I get a motion, please? 
um, uh, motion made by uh, Commissioner Kern, seconded Scarborough. by Commissioner Scarborough. Yes, swearing in. All in favor? All those Aye. wishing. Opposed? Thank you, sorry. <laughs> All those wishing to testify or speak on any of today's items, please rise and raise your right hand. Anybody that's going to be giving public comment today? Um, Do we have everybody in the room that is, has um, filled out a card and will be making public comment? If you could please stand. <clears throat> okay. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Amendments to the agenda? Okay, we do have an amendments to the agenda on the dais for you, and I will run through them. <clears throat> Item number seven, which is ZBDOA 2022-2186 Century Village. Staff received a request to withdraw three of the four variances. Variance one, two, and four um, have been withdrawn at the request of the applicant. They have an attached letter, and no motion is necessary. So when we get to item number seven for the variances, it'll just be on variance number three, which is the side setback. Okay. okay. The, uh, to moving on, um, I am under consent agenda. We have two items, number five and six, DOA uh, PDD 2021-1373 Sussman AGR PUD, as well as number six, PDD CAW 2021-1361 Atlantic AGR Commercial and Self Storage. The request is to move those from the regular agenda to the consent agenda. We also have a letter uh, from the Delray Lakes Alliance Association uh, for support. They are working through some slight modifications to the wall condition that is next to Delray Lake Estates between now and BCC. Um, we'd like to pull item number two just to have um, something right into the record by um, one of the co-owners <coughs> of the property. Um, that is ABN DOA 2022-507 Arrigo MUPD. We have amended and added conditions for that particular application as well that are on the amendments to the agenda for architecture and utilities. Um, also on the regular agenda for the Century Village application um, that falls over to page two of the amendments, we have an added condition for site design uh, for exhibit C2 and an amended use limitation condition uh, number one, that's also part of the development order amendment in exhibit C2. And that will end the uh, modifications to the agenda. Okay, I'm sorry, Would, can I please get an approval of the minutes? Can we get that? I'm sorry. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Okay, um, motion made by Commissioner Kern, seconded by Commissioner Carolando. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Motion. As amended. As amended. Seconded. Okay. Um, motion made by Commissioner Scarborough, seconded by Commissioner Kern. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Any disclosures? None. No disclosures. Only a gentleman that walked up and started talking to me before the uh, name Robert. Okay. Here at this meeting. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. No. Did no. No. Other than the one gentleman. Okay. Okay. All right. Any conflicts or recusals? None. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. I have uh, recused myself on item number seven, ZV DOA twenty twenty one zero two one eight six. I'm recusing my. I'm sorry. I said seven. It's eight. Let me back up. ZCA 2021-02123, my company, Architecture Green, has uh, design contracts with Jay Morton, Planning and Landscape Architecture. Okay. Which item was that? Number eight. Okay. All right. Any others? No? Nope. That's okay. It. Okay. So moving on, uh, we will bypass the postponement agenda so that'll bring us to the consent agenda um, and what we have our items one three four 
for a vote on the consent. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, and five and six, yes. Okay. All right. Do we have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Motion to consent. Do I get a second? Second. Okay. Um, motion um, made by Commissioner Caliendo, seconded by Commissioner Scarborough. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. That'll bring us to our regular agenda. Um, this, item number. All right. Okay. All right. But just before we proceed with our regular um, regular agenda, I just want to just set a few. I don't really want to call them ground rules. Um, we do have uh, a number of people that will be speaking today that wish to speak, um, um, and we just want to make sure that it will be two minutes per person. Okay. Once those two minutes are up, you will be you know, motion to finish what it is that you are st that you are saying. We also, while we recognize that everybody has a right to, you know, to be here, to voice your opinion, and, you know, we're glad that you are here, that we will not be tolerating any applause, any jeers, any, you know, anything like that. We just ask that everybody remains respectful and gives everyone the chance to say what they're here to say. Okay? Thank you. So that'll bring us to um, item number two that we pulled from consent, uh, which is ABN DOA 2022-00507 for the Arrigo Dodge, a development order abandonment and a development order amendment. Um, the uh, One of the property owners wanted to speak, um, basically stating they wanted to work on some conditions with the other property owner. So Meredith Lay, if they can come, they have she has a card submitted, I believe. Okay. Meredith Lay with Shuts and Bowen with for Arigo. Um, we are the other property owner in the MUPD, and we have a request that you speak loud and cannot hear you in the back. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Meredith Lay with Shuts and Bowen with for Arrigo. Um, we are the other property owner in the MUPD, and uh, just wanted to uh, come today to speak on the item. And just make it clear, we, are, we do want to be good neighbors. We are not here in opposition. Um, and we don't want to delay the project, but what we do want to make uh, sure that there are some items that were, uh, that were, there were some changes that were made on the site plan that affect our portion of the site plan. And it's really minor, it just has to do with building labeling and the and moving of a building that was unbuilt in phase one from in the site data table to reflect that it is still part of phase one. On the on the site data table, consistent with what how it shows on the site plan, and we've spoken to the applicant and with staff, and I believe they've agreed, and they'll speak to it um, to go ahead and make these changes, incorporate these changes before the BCC, or as a condition of approval. Thank you. If the applicant can come to the record. Morning, everyone. Scott Backman. Good to see you all again. Um, yes, I uh, had an opportunity to speak with Meredith uh, a little earlier. Uh, we are in agreement with, um, with uh, the, the comments that Meredith had made. I believe we're also speaking later this afternoon uh, collectively with our clients in order to work through this. And I think staff has addressed a couple of these items uh, that Meredith was noting more generally uh, in your staff reporting conditions already. And so uh, I don't anticipate there being any issues here uh, moving forward. And if there are any, we'll certainly work with staff between now and BCC. Thank you. And staff is in agreement. Okay. It's nice to have everybody in agreement. <laughs> okay. All right. So only one motion is necessary on this one, which relates to the development order amendment. Okay. All right. Can I get a motion? Motion to recommend approval of a development order amendment to reconfigure the site plan, add square footage, modify delete conditions of approval, and modify phasing subject to conditions of approval as indicated in Exhibit C. Second. And amended on the add delete. As amended. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, motion, motion made by Commissioner Scarborough, seconded by Commissioner Caliendo. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. 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 Uh, 
Okay, that will bring us to item number seven. ZVDOA 2021-2186, Essentiary Village Resident Service Center. The request before you is a type two variance as well as a development order amendment on 2.38 acres of land. Staff is recommending approval of the remaining variance V3, subject to the conditions of approval as indicated in Exhibit C1. Staff is also recommending approval of the development order amendment, subject to the conditions as amended um, and indicated in Exhibit C2. You can turn it over to the applicant to provide a presentation and then staff's follow up. Um, I, I, I just ha I have a question. If the, uh, if the applicants, the people for, we do have a large number of people wishing to speak to item number seven. Is there any opposition to moving to number eight um, beforehand? Um, exchanging tides of town water with resident service center. Do that to pull that ahead. Is that? That's fine with staff if that's that what okay? the board would like to do. Yeah. Okay. If we could do that, please. Uh, so if we, it, we I'm sorry. A, we can get a motion on that. Okay. I'll move. Okay. 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 Motion made by Commissioner Scarborough, seconded by Commissioner Caliendo. Can we please get the applicant then for a number? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. We can please get the applicant for number eight. Sorry for giving you short notice there. Okay. <laughs> No problem. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, my name is Jennifer Morton with J. Morton Planning and Landscape Architecture. Um, I'm here today representing Akel Homes. Um, Akel Homes has developed many quality projects in Palm Beach County from um, Isabella to Bellagio, Villaggio to Scana Isles. Um, they're developing a parcel in Avenir. They have sites in St. Lucie County that they're developing. So housing is their, their business. And we're here today representing a infill project um, that's proposed to be a townhouse community. On that note, we all know about the housing crisis facing Palm Beach County and the efforts that our county commissioners are making to address the housing shortage. Next week, voters are going to cast their ballot on a $200 million bond referendum to assist with the housing crisis. The Board of County Commissioners has made significant steps to increase density in the Ag Reserve from one unit to the acre to eight units to the acre. And it's my understanding that there are additional adjustments being proposed to the mandatory workforce housing program. The crisis is not going to be solved by government alone. A housing supply deficit as big as Palm Beach County faces, requires partnering with developers one project at a time. Government, advisory boards, and elected officials need to support infill development and increase density where it is appropriate. I am presenting an infill project that is appropriately located along a major east-west corridor corridor with appropriate density of 7.4 dwelling units per acre and is providing a much needed townhouse product. So we have two requests before you today. The first one is to rezone the property to RS and staff supports this request. The second is a request for a um, conditional use for townhouses. This staff is recommending denial. Um, townhouses are not allowed in LR1 land uses. However, we are requesting a land use change to MR5. If the Board of County Commissioners supports the land use change, we request, respectfully request that the Zoning Commission support our request for a townhouse development at this location. So this is an aerial, this is Hypoluxo Road. The property is located on the south side of Hypoluxo Road. It's 9.24 acres in size. It truly is a small infill site. It's surrounded by land uses such as LR3 and MR5 directly across the street. And on the south side of Hypoluxo Road, we have LR1 and LR3. 
These are the zoning districts in the area. As I mentioned, we're requesting RS. Staff supports RS. RS is across the street and Winston Trails and also along the corridor. We do have RT as well. So really, let's get into the details of the site plan. This is the proposed site plan. Again, 9.24 acres. We're requesting MR5, which the Board of County Commissioners will make a decision on. We're actually allowed, with that land use designation, 74 townhouses. However, we're proposing 69 units. That's a density of 7.4 dwelling units per acre, which really is a, when you think about a townhouse product, is on the lower end of density. The housing type, again, is townhouses. We are utilizing the workforce housing program for increasing density. If we were building our workforce housing units on site, we would be required 11. We're relocating them off site down the street at a multifamily project. Therefore, we're required one and a half times the workforce housing. So that works out to be 17 workforce housing units. You can see from the site plan, our only ingress and egress to the site is off of Hypoluxo Road. We have a right in, right out, a left in, and a left out. Pursuant to the request of Palm Beach County, we have an emergency access only onto Ranches Road, which is on the south side of the subject site. It is a gated community, and you can see from the overall design, we've worked hard on the um, site design to create a very open feeling when you enter the community. The lake is accessible and viewable to all. We have a fitness trail and other amenities within the community. So let's look at a detail of what these townhouse units are um, designed to be. The code requires a minimum 16 foot wide for a townhouse. We are proposing a 24 foot wide townhouse. So these are nice sized townhouse units, two car garages, two story product type. The lot depth is 100 feet. We have 25 feet in the front and we have 25 feet around the rear of the um, unit along the perimeter. Our entrance, as I mentioned, is gated. Um, we have a nice recreational area. We have a pool, a cabana bath, and we also have an 1,800-foot clubhouse that will include a fitness area and meeting rooms. When you look at the buffers that surround the property, we have on the north side, we have a 20-foot right-of-way buffer adjacent to Hypoluxo Road. Our units are actually set back much further because between our property and the Hypoluxo Road right away, we have a 70 foot Lakeworth Drainage District Canal. Along our east property line, adjacent to the Presbyterian Church, we have a 15 foot type 2 incompatibility buffer. And then along our south property line, adjacent to Ranches Road, we have, and Ranches Road is a 60 foot right away. We have a 10-foot utility easement and a 15-foot right-of-way buffer that overlaps the utility easement by five feet. Along our east property line, I'm sorry, along our west property line, where we're adjacent to a single-family home, again, we have a type 2 incompatibility buffer to buffer the single-family home from the townhouse product. Staff has recommended to um, a couple of conditions of approval should this board support the townhouse project and should the Board of County Commissioners support the townhouse project. Um, there are three conditions of approval that we are requesting to be deleted. Uh, the first one addresses the perimeter buffer along our south and west property line. We're required a 15 foot, foot buffer. Staff is proposing a 35 foot buffer. The next two conditions relate to the site, site design. Um, the setback for the townhouses, are, we have a 25-foot rear setback. Staff is proposing a 35-foot rear setback when adjacent to the south property line and west property line. And finally, they're requesting that the lake or water management track be relocated to the west and south property line. 
So this graphic demonstrates the impact of those proposed conditions. Again, this is a very small infill site. It's less than 10 acres. Our existing buffer along our west and south property lines complies about 0.43 acres. If we were to increase that buffer to 35 feet, that would be an acre of land devoted to the south and west property line. And keep, a, keep in mind, our south property line abuts a 60-foot right-of-way. The second item that impacts the property is the increased rear setback for our buildings. That is about 0.27 acres in land area. So when you have a, uh, just over a nine acre site and you have almost an acre of land that is being designated to a setback and um, buffer for two property lines, it makes a significant impact and changes the look and feel of the project. The final item is relocating that lake. We worked hard to design this site to create a quality townhouse project. When you enter this development, you have the water management track, the fitness area, a very open feel. Our units are around the perimeter. We have the two units that do back up to the lake. But by relocating that lake to the south property line or west property line, then we're gonna end up with either smaller units and back-to-back -back units. So we believe that as the project is designed, is the best design for this community and has, um, does not have a negative impact on the south or west property line. So let's look at the, the Hypoluxo corridor. Again, Hypoluxo is a major east-west roadway. It, it, it has a term, I mean, I'm sorry, it has an I-95 interchange, and there's a proposed planned future interchange at the Florida Turnpike. Hypoluxo in front of our property is actually a six-lane median divided highway with 110 feet of right-of-way. If you look at the developments along the Hyperluxo corridor, many of these PUDs have clustered townhouses or multifamily along Hyperluxo Road, and then behind that product type, they've located their single family development. Most of the projects that have been approved in the past include larger tracts of land, so they're able to do this. What's left are these smaller infill tracks, and our site abuts Hypoluxo Road, just like these other sites do. If you look at River Mill or Lantern Key or even Silverwood, they've put their townhouses along Hypoluxo Road and their single family behind. Toscana Isles is, was developed by Akel Homes, the developer for this site. They have multifamily along Hypoluxo Road, and they have the single family in the rear. Even in the staff report, it acknowledges that townhouses are a consistent residential use within the area, dependent on the layout and function. And we believe our layout and the site functions and the be benefits the residents that would move into the community and has no negative impact along the existing corridor. You may have read in the staff report um, about this area being considered an enclave because of the LR1 land use designation. Um, the enclave that has been identified by staff is in this dashed yellow line you can see that much of this enclave has already been developed. If you look at the um, yellow areas, those are developments that have been approved, um, and many of those developments that are further interior to the enclave were five and 10 acre tracks that were subdivided into one acre lots. And the area along Sa Saddle Road, those units are less than one acre. So if you look at the corridor, if you look at Hypoluxo Road, which is really our, the front for our project, that corridor has commercial at the intersection. There are three churches that have been approved along that corridor, and there are several nursery sites. So our, our project fits in with the corridor and does not directly impact the community or the developments to the south. We're separated by Ranches Road.
One other thing I want to point out is the um, some of you may be familiar with the Pioneer Road enclave and the overlay that was approved by the board. The board specifically excluded those parcels that were adjacent to Jog Road. We're requesting the same um, review to exempt the properties that are adjacent to Hypoluxo and only access off of Hypoluxo. Workforce housing, I just want to let you know that we are um, we are providing workforce housing. The workforce housing ordinance allows the workforce housing units to be um, cashed out, built on site, or built off site. We're utilizing the off site option. I think the project that was presented to you a couple of months ago was actually proposing to cash out. We are not cashing out. We're building those workforce housing units actually on the same street, just further to the west. You can see our existing towns at Tidewater site. Our, our client is also developing the Villages of Windsor multifamily project at the corner of Lyons Road and Hypoluxo Road. We're proposing to put our 17 units there. In summary, um, we are proposing a quality townhouse project that is compatible with the Hypoluxo Road corridor. We are within the urban suburban tier. We're east of Jog Road. You know, when it comes to location, this is the ideal location for this medium density type product. We are addressing the workforce housing requirements. We are addressing a supply shortage that we have in housing. And the infrastructure is currently in place to deal with this project. We have the road the water, the sewer, the schools, the fire rescue, the public transportation. You know, in closing, a lot of planning articles have been written. The one that is on the screen is from the Journal of Planning, Education, and Research. And seminars have been given regarding the negative effects of limiting development to single family through single family zoning and land use, restricting housing options, especially along a major transportation corridor, such as at the proposed location, further sprawl and inefficient land use patterns. We are presenting an opportunity to bring a much needed 69 unit townhouse project to market with 17 workforce housing units. If the BCC supports the land use change to MR5, we respectfully request support from this commission for our Class A conditional use to develop the proposed townhouse project as presented. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know if I want to take a pause here. Staff was informed that there was um, a member of the public that put in a card for item number one. So I don't know if you'd like to pause this so that they can speak or how you'd like to handle. Um, if, if it's okay, we'll, we, you know, we do a motion so that that member can, that person can, can speak. Uh, you, you can do that now or you can you can wait until after the item but it, they can come up and speak and um, then you can ask if anybody would like to reconsider the item okay Could, do, would you mind if we finish because we are in the middle of this one if we can we do that once we finished item number if that's what you prefer then yeah. we can do that yeah okay just because we're kind of in the motion here so I'd like staff to do their presentation we'll do it immediately following item number thanks Okay, staff presentation. This is Wendy Hernandez, the Deputy Zoning Director. So I will do a summary of the towns at Tidewater. The site is located on the south side of Hypoluxo Road, uh, just east of Jog. It currently has an LR1, which is low residential, one unit per acre future land use and an AR agricultural zoning classification. The site is actually two lots for a total of 9.24 acres. The request before the board is uh, two. Uh, one includes an official zoning map amendment to allow the rezoning from the AR zoning classification to the RS, which is single family residential classification, as, long, as well as a class A conditional use uh, to allow uh, workforce housing density bonus uh, via the um, 
no, to allow townhouse units, I'm sorry, um, for the property. They do have a workforce housing density bonus um, that is subject to administrative approval. This density bonus is an administrative approval. Um, this is solely based on if the land use were to be approved at the MR5. Um, uh, process changes um, if MR5 doesn't um, get approved. Can you hit the slide? Okay, so the details of the site plan um, were presented by the applicant. They are proposing 69 townhouse dwelling units. They have a 0.3 acre recreation area and a 1.3 acre lake and access from Hypoluxo with an emergency on Ranches Road. Hit the next slide, please. At time of publication, we've received zero contact from the public. And this application that we have before you is contingent on a land use amendment, a small scale. Um, this was presented to the Planning Commission on October 14th um, to make a determination and recommendation on the land use change from LR1 to MR5. At that time, the Planning Commission is recommending that they do an amendment from LR1 to LR3, not MR5, with conditions of approval, and that vote was 10 to 0. The planning staff are recommending denial of the MR5 future land use change. Staff is recommending approval of the official zoning map uh, from AR to RS. The reason why we are recommending approval of that is because regardless of the MR5 land use change, uh, RS zoning is consistent with LR1, LR3, and MR5. So we have no issue with rezoning the property to RS. We are recommending denial of the townhouse uh, request for the Class A. So if the board were to move forward with a denial of the land use change to MR5, townhouses would not be allowed on this property in RS. Uh, so we have found that it is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, consistency with the code, and change circumstances is why we have our recommendation for denial on the uh, townhouses. Um, and again, it's all contingent on the, the future land use change. Um, if they were to do LR3, like the Planning Commission recommended, the zoning application would also have to not move forward because there would be additional requests that would have to be re-advertised and request to get to the 69 units. Um, if the board moves forward with the MR5, staff has included the uh, design changes and conditions of approval to address the impacts of townhouses and the density. Um, on the property. So that's why the agent was bringing up concerns with our, our, our discussion that we have on the setbacks and the lake, and it's all design related um, for MR5. But we are recommending approval of the rezoning, and we are recommending denial of the townhouse units. And that would conclude my presentation. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Comments from the commissioners? Oh yes, uh, yeah. do we have the, uh, we've got a few cards. All right, okay. All right, so when I uh, call your name, please step up to the either the west or east podium. Uh, Ellen Tannenhill. And Dennis McKenzie. This is uh, just a reminder, you do have two minutes to state your comments. We have a clock that's up here and a buzzer that will sound. So, Miss Ellen, you're first. Uh, I'm Ellen Tannehill. I live at 6388 Ranches Road in the neighborhood. Our neighborhood is considered still a rural neighborhood, so these townhouses, even though they're on the other side of Ranches Road, are inconsistent with our neighborhood. I support the staff's uh, decision to go with LR3 and the changes in the plan that would buffer more of our neighborhood. I do not approve of the MR5. I know we needed affordable housing, but you don't try and bulldoze over people that are already there in the neighborhood. Um, 
I would approve the LR3, and there was originally he could get his density up, up if he bought TDRs and everything, but apparently they want to go the cheaper route and go right to the MR5. Um, that's all I have to say. I, I do not approve of the project as it is now. It, and we are not, and that is not an infill property because, because of the other zoning around it. It's not considered an infill property. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, ma'am. I, I have a question for the. Ellen, how do you exit um, Ranches Road? Where well, I'm at the very end of Ranches Road, so I go off of Jog Road. Depending on how backed up Jog Road is, I may go back out through the neighborhood hood because there is another, there is a street light on Western Way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dennis McKenzie, I live at 5906 Ranches Road, and I agree with staff that these townhomes are completely inappropriate for the area. Uh, just all, anything uh, south or, or west of that was acreage, and uh, most of it to the south that was just built and sold for one acre over a million dollars homes there uh, are LR1. So uh, to put these uh, townhomes in is like putting sardines in a can, whatever. Uh, there's more homes on this uh, townhouse development than there is in the uh, acreage left there in Palm Beach ranches. So uh, I oppose uh, uh, these townhouses. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next two is going to be Constance Allen and Lorian McKenzie. Please state your name and address for the record. My name's Constance Allen. I live at 5907 Ranches Road. And I am here to oppose this huge, dense project for the main reason this enclave, which we are an established rural enclave, which you could see by there, they're trying to give you an idea of the other surrounding areas. We've been established there for decades. I'm not kidding. I've been there since 1984. The other places that have, were developed in the more dense places were farming areas. So everybody else came from bare land. We are an established community. And I am opposed to this density. I'm opposed to them accessing our road. Think about the construction down the road. <laughs> driving in and up and down our road. So, I mean, the big picture is it's too dense. We're a small community. And as Dennis explained, there were other things purchased when other growers moved out of this area. And everybody worked with us. They're an LR3 in Osprey Oaks. And the other one uh, um, acre communities also were very are beautiful and I mean clearly that could be done on this side as well because it's it's not an infill it's part of our neighborhood and I would consider you denying that and thank you for your time thank you Lorian McKenzie my husband and I have been there also since the 80s since 1980 ranches Palm Beach ranches that kind of says it's a rural area it is a little enclave right off Hypoluxo the road goes down, Ranches Road comes off Jog. It goes down a mile, it turns a quarter mile, and it comes back onto Jog. In that community, we're all, I believe, one acre or more. We're on five acres. A lot of people have five, a lot have one. But like my husband mentioned, the developer, first he worked with us to do, Palm Be uh, to do Osprey Oaks, then he developed Osprey Estates. Million dollar homes, five and 6,000 square feet, so there are ways the developer can make a profit on beautiful homes instead of putting this sardine can. Now it affects us in a lot of ways. Before the meeting this morning, we had 30 wood ducks. We had two Cooper's hawk in the front. These are all animals that have little area to go to. And I know this will be developed, but this particular site harvested all their slash pines a few years ago. They knocked down everyone. 
Now, we all had pine beetles in the neighborhood. Some pine trees died. They didn't all die. So we knew something was coming to make this look like vacant land. But even the neighbor next door has horses, parrots, and I can't foresee townhomes coming in. First, the density between schools, driving, everything else. I know it's allowable, but it will impact our neighborhood. And as Melissa McKinley said before, we need to support the people who are here. We need to add housing, but you don't ruin what's there. You don't take take over the street and change it to a very dense population. So the townhomes work well on Hypoluxo, but not on this enclave. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Carl Tewilliger and Joseph Essa, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep your conversation down. <coughs> Thank you. Carl, you're first. Well, please state your name and address for the record. My name is Carl Terwilliger. I live at 5782 Ranches Road with my wife, Donna Leone, since 1984. Um, we have a small native plant nursery. We're surrounded with um, mangro mango groves, um, various kinds of fruit groves as well, nurseries, and other kinds of small agricultural farming establishments. So this is one of the unique communities where people can come in, like us, and have our own business, raise our son, be there for him, and for the community. Since we raise native plants, we have a lot of people coming to us to redo their yards. We have the other neighbor with her mangoes, and um, she supplies people from the community. Also our neighborhood with our roadways add up to two and a half miles of very low traffic almost park-like experience where people from the surrounding communities come with their kids on their bikes and just it's a constant parade on weekends and during the week in front of our house, which is a good thing. It's a place where people can relax and enjoy something that is disappearing quickly. I feel that sticking this development on the end of our road will ruin the character, our, character of our community, especially since the seven acres across the street from us to the north of us is owned by an absentee land landowner, and he plans on putting a development of his own there. So it's getting the camel's nose in the tent is what we're allowing with this. And I think it should stay as one unit per acre or even less units per acre in order to keep the quality of our community, which serves everybody with agricultural products, a place to relax, walk your kids, you can go through the whole two and a half acres and come across maybe two cars. And everybody goes slowly. Because Thank you, sir. That's two minutes? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm against changing, I'm against changing the zoning. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. Can I give this to you? Yes. Something Motion to receive and file. All in favor? Aye. Okay. My thoughts. All right. Thank you. Mr. Joseph? Yes, my name's Joseph Issa. I live on 5682 Ranches Road, and we moved here 22 years ago because we like the rural area that we've seen. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, developers have been encroaching on our little development, and they took half of it years ago, and now they're trying to take more of it, and we all have, there's a total of 11 horses in our neighborhood and our rural area has just been encroached on and I think that we should not have this townhouse development in our neighborhood and that's all I've got to say and I'm against it thank you thank you sir please consider it. Sonia Prather and Roxanne Old. Please state your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Sonia Prather. I'm at 5959 Ranches Road. Um, I have a one acre property. Um, it faces ranches um, and I'm on the Hypolexo side. So um, I would like to state that I am opposed to 
the project with um, the townhouses, it's it's a unicorn of a neighborhood, and I know development needs to happen, but there is so very little of this left. Um, it's a neighborhood where you can still kind of occasionally see foxes, and there's tons of rabbits, and it, it's um, it took us seven years to save up for this one acre property, and we saved up hard, and I and I hunted this neighborhood just to find one acre of peace and. If this happens, it's going to set a precedent. The guy behind me, I know he's he's got his hands in developers. The one next to him was bought for developers. There's tons of people just lopping up all the all the acreage that are these sites and face hypolexo, and they're just waiting for something like this to happen because if it does, it's just going to be you know, open the floodgates for all the other future developers to point at it and go, well, you guys let this through, maybe you'll let this through. And I, I just, I, I just think it just wrecks the integrity of all the people that are there to add 69 homes, which is more homes than were, that have been there for the 30 years. Um, and I get you need to, if you need to zone up and get a couple of houses per acre, I get that. You know, maybe two houses per acre, which is what the other people did, but but the townhouse project is just gonna it's it's gonna allow like people like the guy who bought behind me the three and a half acres, he'll then be able to put apartments in. Thank you. Or thank you. Miss Roxanne? Hi, I'm Roxanne Ald. I live right next to this proposed monstrosity. I have had a farm there since 1978. I have chickens, a lot of them, ducks, horses, everything you can imagine. I raise animals, and that's why I'm there. I have two and a half acres, and I have you know all my neighbors have been real, real good neighbors up until this. Since I've been there, actually, uh, he he. Uh, let me change for a minute here. He has two parcels he bought. One of which a house was knocked down to get. The other was a, a really nice uh, nursery type operation where the guy just raised orchids for a rich man in Palm Beach. So he's two parcels, two parcels he has and 124 in this settlement. And he wants to ruin the whole thing for two parcels of land. I think it's a joke what he's planning on putting there. It's, it's ridiculous. I don't see how he's planning on making money on it, even, even what he puts there. He ought to just take the one per acre, build a nice house, and be done with it. Since he's been there, he's, uh, he's uh, done a lot to get me out, too, I can tell you. He's, uh, uh, my water went bad. He moved in August 20, and 11, 19, 20, my water went bad. The whole neighborhood was poisoned. October, let's see now, uh, this, the, the latest die-off on my ducks and chickens was 12 chickens, Seven ducks poisoned March 9th, 1922. And before that, there was a die off of a bunch of chickens. I think he doesn't like animals next to him because they won't be good for townhouses. I don't plan on leaving my property. I, I can't say he did it. That's the only reason I haven't done anything to prosecute him because you can't prove these things. But there you go. Uh, it, either way, I can say it's not a good property to be next to mine. I have a farm and everybody in there is out there for animals that's why they're there everybody plans to grow old and die there thank you ma'am your time thank is up you. that conclude the cards we have on that yes madam commissioner that concludes the public comments portion okay ladies and gentlemen please keep your comments down okay uh, open the floor to my commissioners I had a question for the applicant It's just a simple question. I was just curious, on the 17 uh, workforce housing that you are going to build, do you have a timeline on that or a proposed timeline? Um, both projects are in the system right now and moving forward, and we will have uh, conditions of approval that require the workforce housing to be built concurrent with the development of this project. So we can't build this unless we have our workforce. So. They'll okay. be built at the same time, and it's the same developer, so there's some continuity there. Okay, thank you. How many uh, 
how many more trips on Hypoluxo Road are we talking about based on your density of 69 units with two car garages and the potential for four vehicles per unit? Um, you know, I don't have my staff report. I know it's in the staff report. Uh, I can answer that. Thank you. Uh, they will, this project will generate 32 uh, morning peak trips and 39 uh, evening peak trips. Okay. The, um, and just based on, on your, your knowledge, if, it, if the zoning was not um, MR, what would the difference, what's the differential? Can you, give, can you spitball it? I mean, it all depends on, you know, what is the density or intensity of that. Uh, okay, what if, what if we went with, what if we went with, it's a nine acre parcel, what if we went with nine units? What would the difference be? Nine single family? Yes. Units? Yes. Uh, nine single family unit, units will generate approximately nine evening peak hour trips. As opposed to 32 in the morning and, and 30, 39, 39 in the, in the yeah. evening? Right. Okay. Um, so based on, ma'am, based on staff's recommendation, uh, if we went with staff recommendation, where does that leave you? Well, with staff's recommendation, we would not be able to build this project because they're recommending denial of the townhouses. So we, it would leave us with no project. We'd have to go back and regroup. But I know I heard the comments from the community. I just want to make clear, we will not access Ranches Road. Our only ingress and egress is from Hypoluxo. Under, so. Understand, I, I, I'm on Hypoluxo Road okay. almost every day of the week on okay. my bike. Um, uh, through Jog Road down Hypoluxo, so okay. I mean that's that's an area that I'm very familiar with. So I, I'm, and that's why I ask those traffic questions because th okay. that's an area of my my business. Oh, great. Um, there were eight residents that spoke, madam. Yes. Eight residents representing uh, in excess of 160 years of of residential Palm Beach County living. Um, at, at what point in the process, uh, how many of those folks did? Did you guys speak to prior to um, coming to us? And what so, kind of just describe your engagement and 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 how you worked with the the residents in the area. So this area is represented by Cobra. Mm -hmm. So we um, requested to present our project to the Cro Cobra Growth Management Committee. We presented to Cobra Growth Management um, probably about three or four weeks ago, and so that's we've. Pretty much worked through Cobra. I do know that our client and um, has spoken with the directly affected neighbor to the west, and I think uh, that hasn't gone well. So we um, we worked through the Cobra, through okay. Cobra. But, but none of the residents on ranches. Did you? Do, and was there no. any outreach? Did you do any mailers? Did anybody knock on any doors other than the the young lady that was up talking about uh, her farm? No, we did not. Why not? Because normally we go through if there's a neighbor if there's a neighborhood group called like Cobra or Delray Alliance usually we go through them and they've actually requested that we go through them rather than reach out directly to the um, impacted community and I can give an example um, the villages of Windsor project that where we're transferring our units to we started out by reaching out to the directly affected community which was um, Valencia I had meetings with them and then we went to the um, we presented the project and Cobra came out and said that we should have gone to them first so we're following the Cobra process by going to Cobra I am happy you know, to meet with these residents and you know go into more detail with our site plan um, but we've been following following the process that's been um, established by Cobra. Okay. If I may, if I may, through the chair, the coalition of Boynton West residential associations is a coalition of resi residential 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 associations. It's it doesn't allow membership for individuals, and it doesn't have memberships of every acre of land within its boundaries. So I don't know that this neighborhood has represented representation on COBRA. I would imagine they don't because it doesn't have a homeowners association proper because it's not a um, 
you know, it might have a property owners association, but it wouldn't have a homeowners association, which is the membership of COBRA. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to clarify that for the record. And I can commit to meeting, re meeting with the residents um, between now and the Board of County Commissioner hearing. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, um, go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, for now. thank you, Commissioner. Uh, question for staff. Um, there were several residents uh, who mentioned the terms rural enclave, and as you all know, being a resident of the Pioneer Road rural enclave, uh, I'm very familiar with the process. Is this a designated enclave or rural enclave? There's been discussion at the board. I don't know if this is one of the neighborhoods that. Um, was identified and Brian Davis can fill us in to actually go through the process to get that identification in the plan. But typically when we did the analysis to come up with what a rural enclave was, it's neighborhoods with LR1, mm -hmm. LR2, surrounded by urban development were, were the gist. And this is one of the areas I studied with the amendment that worked on that. Absolutely. Um, Brian, was there any specific direction on this neighborhood yet? Well, the, the staff report, the planning, for the, the land use amendment identified this as being an area that, that would be a rural enclave. It has not come forward. I believe there's an area not too far away that's now in the process of doing it. Uh, however, the county's comprehensive plan and through the amendment that Lisa was referencing now recognizes that rural enclaves are part of the lifestyle preservation that's part of our tier system. It was a recognition prior to that that there was a, effectively the rural, or excuse me, the urban suburban area was expected to completely convert to urban uses. There was an acknowledgement later, uh, about seven years ago, that these areas should be respected and not forced to convert. So the policy change that Lisa was referencing, that reflects that. That's what these rural enclave areas are. They are, are warranted for protection because of the uniqueness and so forth. So that's why you had a staff recommend, in part why you had a staff recommendation for denial of the land use amendment. For a lot of other issues which I'm happy to go into, but those are more on the, the density side. Happy to, to go into that if you'd like, but not necessarily your question. Not, not, not needed for, I'm, I'm aware, aware of the process. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I. I'm good. I support staff's recommendations. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, before we get too much further, um, I uh, think it would be appropriate to ask if the applicant had any more uh, rebuttals to anything that might have been said. Uh, they kind of opened the door to it with some of the comments. I wanted to make sure that they felt like they were given their time to okay. respond. Can, all right. Can I just see if anybody else, any of the other commissioners may have comments because then at that time she can address them all in their entirety? Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, it's it's um, it's more an opportunity for the applicant to <clears throat> respond to any staff or public comments, not necessarily for them to respond to the commissioners. This is normally done prior to commissioner comments. We kind of missed the moment in time. We're not new. I don't know. What do you want to do? Um, yes, Jennifer Morton with Jay Morton. Um, just two things I wanted to, after hearing the um, comments from the residents, our access again is on Hypoluxo. It's not on ranches. And as the community mentioned, um, you know, LR1, what would that lead to? That leads to one acre lot selling for over a million dollars. There has to be um, opportunities for a variety of housing. And we believe that with this site, with frontage and access on Hypoluxo, with no impact on the community to the south, that this really provides an opportunity to increase the density, add another option for housing, and um, at the same time provide additional workforce housing. So we have the workforce housing, we have the townhouse, which is a mid-range, and then if the properties to the south that are five-acre lots want to subdivide to one acre and sell four million, that's great. There's a market for that too. But um, if we're going to deal with the housing crisis, we have to find these parcels which would allow us to add to our housing stock. And I think this is an ideal location for that. Thank you. I have a question based on um, what's the ballpark uh, price range for the 69 units? You know, low number, high number, mm -hmm. uh, any number will do so I yeah. can calculate real quick. Um, you know, my client keeps saying it'll be based on the market. It'll be based on what the market is at the time that he they go to construction. But I would say 400, 500 would be what the market is today, but we don't know, we can't predict the future, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, I did want to, uh, just to make um, a, a comment that you had said that you'd be more than happy to meet with the residents, I think it's a little late. I think that 
you know, the meeting with the residents, as nice as that be, should have happened beforehand. Right. Not that everything has been submitted and now you're, you know, to sit down to listen to what they have to say, which may impact how you would have moved forward. Okay. Okay. Mountain Chair, I, I've got to agree. I think that, that these poor people, they're, they're sitting out there, they don't have representation. Mm -hmm. um, I doubt that COBRA reached out to them and, and set up a meeting to sit down and talk with them. Um, I would be in favor of this if this was all workforce housing. That, I believe, is where our crisis is, is in workforce housing, not necessarily housing. Um, the people that can't afford to purchase homes in our county. Um, I, I, I would agree with staff on uh, staff's recommendations. And if this goes forward, I would certainly recommend that you set up a, a time to meet with these homeowners and figure something out. Will do. We did, but if I could just make a comment, before the Planning Commission meeting, there was one letter of objection, and that was from the directly affected neighbor, and our client did reach out to them. But I realize that many more people have come forward, and I will work with the residents that live there. Would you, would you accept postponing this until you've had time to sit down with the residents? I don't think my client would support a postponement. Thank you and I won't support them either. Well, I kind of agree with my fellow commissioners. I, I have several objections here. One, and I'm not the expert in engineering here, but the traffic flow that you're discussing on 71 units and the price point that you're speaking of is going to be mostly working class people, not people that are home working on their farms or ranches or retirement homes. That will have a far less traffic impact. But when you tell me there's 30 some odd in the mornings and 39 in the evenings, when most of those people have three and four car, car, car uh, cars, I just think that's just a very low number. And I think there's much more impact on these communities than you're leading to believe. And just because they're, you're saying there's only an impact on one side, on the south, there's three other sides to this property. And I think they should be taken into account. And furthermore, I totally agree with my fellow commissioners that you really let the ball go drop, not meeting with these people that are adjacent to this property. That to me, you should have done your homework before you came before us, honestly. That and a couple other things, the reason I would not support this whatsoever, it's too much of a density. Thank you. Uh, question, <clears throat> these two or three story townhomes? Two. Two story, okay. Uh, um, for my comment <laughs> is basically, um, I would discourage us seeing any applications before the land use amendment was in place. <clears throat> I think using the board to potentially put pressure on the zoning change I, I think is inappropriate. I think the zoning or the land use needs to be done first before it comes to the board. If I may speak on that. Um, this is probably, since we've been doing concurrent future land use and zoning amendments since about 1996, this is the first time that we have had a small scale amendment that has this kind of conflict. Typically, these kinds of density increases with a land use change and TDRs and workforce, those are large scale. So they go to the Planning Commission, they go to the Board of County Commissioner for Transmittal, then uh, they come to the zoning commission after the board of county commissioners are already weighed in, and it's and then it goes back again to the board for adoption because the large scale is greater than 10 acres. They have two BCC hearings, and the small scales only have one. So that is the challenge with this one, and why it's a little bit it's it's different. This it was a bit of a challenge for staff to to weigh that out, but really the the ultimate decision maker, you're right, is the board of county commissioners. So. Any other comments from our commissioners? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Hearing that, do we have? Uh, oh, actually, do you? no. I, I do. I have. I have one question. Um, changing from the um, AR to single family. How many units are allowed in the single family residential on this parcel? This parcel um, with the LR1 land use designation can have nine units. Thank you. Okay. All right, I guess I'm, I'm, my final comment on it before we put the motion is I, I am too am very familiar with that area and I do think that it's extremely low ball the number that 
regarding traffic um, with that, uh, you know, with the number of townhomes. I think that the area is extremely diverse at the moment, and I would recommend that you do go back. Again, this developer, there are several other options, and I think that you're going way to the other extreme with what can be put in that area. So I am in agreement as well with, you know, with staff's recommendation. And if we're ready, we make a motion. And I would uh, just suggest handling these <coughs> motions separately, since staff is recommending approval of the amendment and denial of the conditional use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah we, we see that. Um, motion to recommend approval of an official zoning map amendment to allow rezoning from agricultural reserve or agricultural residential zoning district to single family residential zoning district subject to the conditions of approval as indicated in exhibit C1. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Scarborough, seconded by Commissioner Calando. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Move to recommend denial of a Class A conditional use to allow townhomes. Second. Second. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Scarborough, seconded by Commissioner Calando. All those in favor of Aye. denial? Aye. Opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Madam Chair, this is uh, just a reminder that we do have one resident that wishes to speak on item number one that was accidentally uh, missed. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, just just for clarity on the record, um, just can we verbally get that both uh, the first motion was approved and the, the second motion was it? Yes, the the first motion for the record, the first motion was mm -hmm. approved. The second motion was in denial. Thank you. Okay. All right. So yes. So now we will <coughs> we'll go to the the person that wanted wish to speak yep. on item. Agenda item number one. Vicki, can you approach the podium? Vicki McGinnis. Apologies for overlooking you, Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for letting me speak. I, I do appreciate it. Um, my name is Vicki McGinnis, and I am a resident on the street um, where Journey Church is at the end of our street, and they want to um, turn one of their buildings into a general daycare. Um, I'm representing all the residents and homeowners on my street. Um, it's our neighborhood. There's three houses there, um, and then the daycare would be at the end of the street. But um, we all oppose this proposal. Um, it's a very short street, and already we deal with an awful lot of traffic going back and forth to the church and all of their events and meetings and, and all. I've lived on this street for over 27 years. My house is 72 years old. The next door neighbor grew up there. Um, so he's been there over 30 years and he married the girl across the street. So they've been there a while. The people in the first house, they've been there or, or the same owner, same family, for over 35 years, and that house is over 72 years old. We just don't think our neighborhood is a place for a daycare. Um, I think that maybe they are wanting to put a different road within the property somehow, but um, across the street from us is an area where there are preserved pines, and right now the church uses that for parking, but they want to I guess put, I just found out this yesterday the, uh, about a road they want to put through the pines. And then also the amount of traffic that goes up and down our streets for the church um, is just unbelievable. And also the speed of the traffic. There's a lot of young people that go to the church and uh, I mean they start at the church and they just floor it all the way to military trail. And the same, if they turn in at military trail and come down to the church, they just, it's just there's 20 mile per hour speed limits, but they're just flooring it. Um, and then um, they have all these events. Last night there was more than 300 cars there. That means 300 in, 300 out. That's 600 cars. And the, and the traffic last night, after even 10 o'clock, it was still just flying. I only live 10 yards from that street. They had bounce houses last night. They have three services on Sunday. They had a uh, trunk or treat. They have big rallies. They had over a thousand cars there each day a few weeks ago, two two days in a row. And um, thank you, ma'am. 
you, your time is up. Would you like to sum, summarize your, your rest of your statements? Yes. I, I just don't think it's a place for a daycare. And um, they tried it illegally once before when it's Palm Beach Baptist Temple. And they leased it out to other schools. And these other daycares came in and all. And then uh, all the kids and 200 screaming kids out in the yard. And I'm retired. And my next door neighbor works from home. And what's this going to do to our property value if they move in a daycare? There's Thank 19 you, daycares in our vicinity. I checked on Google last night. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, all right. It. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much. I had pictures. I'm this close to the street. And also. Thank you. Thank you. From my street, this is where they want to put their day. Th thank you. Thank you. Did you want to submit those pictures? We can keep those for record. Thank you very much. Should I write what each one is? You can, and then just submit them, and we will. Madam Chair, motion to receive and file. Seconded. And also, if she's going to state she's representing everyone on the street, do you have a, a yes, letter or something, ma'am? Yes, she does. You gave that paperwork yeah, we here? Have to okay, very good. Thank you. Did you uh, want to make a, mo uh, a vote on that motion to receive yeah. file? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got two motions. One, we you could make a motion, please, to receive. We did. Five. We already did just did that. And seconded by Nick. Yeah, we did that. No, there there was no there was a motion. I didn't hear a vote on it. <coughs> okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed. Okay, and do we have a motion? Does anybody wish to open up any questions for item agenda item number one? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Okay, so it mo takes us to item number seven. seven. Um, do we have uh, an, anybody? We have an overflow room. Do do we have people? And are they? Able to, okay. All right. So there may be a, a, a delay as we call the names in order for those people to, to come up. But thank you. Okay. Item number seven, ZVDOA 2021-2186. Um, again, this is Century Village Resident Service Center, and the requests before the board include a type two variance as well as a development order amendment. Um, again, they withdrew variants one, two, and four. Uh, so the presentation will be on variance number three. Staff recommends approval of the variance number three, subject to the conditions in C1, um, and the development order amendment subject to the conditions in C2 as amended on the add delete. And we'll turn it over to the applicant for presentation and then staff. Thank you. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen of the Zoning Commission, my name is Seth Bain. I'm an attorney and a certified land planner with Lewis Longman and Walker. Here today on behalf of my clients, um, Jacob Frankel, Simon Friedman, and the Caucasium of West Palm Beach, LLC. You'll see many of our community members are here today. Many of them have made special uh, arrangements to be here because of the importance of this project uh, to their lives. And so they wanted to be here in support and I appreciate their, their traveling here to be here. You're going to find when we go through this project today that there's a, a lot, much to do about a surprisingly modest request that's before you for a permitted use in an existing commercial building with what is now one minor variance. Um, with that said, I'm going to first set the stage a little bit because this is a request for a place of worship. And when it is a place of worship, there's a slightly different framework that we have to look at it through. So I would begin by asking you this question. Does a county zoning commission have a role to play in protecting the First Amendment's rights of its citizens? And the answer to that is yes. We know it is because of this, something all of you on the zoning commission have probably heard of before. The Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, often referred to as ARLUPA, what is our LUPA? Our LUPA is a federal law. It's a law that applies throughout the nation to any decisions that are made that are affecting someone's First Amendment's rights to express their, their freedom of religion. So what's the purpose of it? It's to prevent governments from using zoning as a means to contravene citizens' First Amendment rights. And it does that through this, something that we in the courts call strict scrutiny. Anytime you have a project 
that could potentially affect someone's First Amendment basic constitutional rights, you have to look at it through a certain lens. And that lens is any plan, any law, any restriction has to A, show that there's a compelling interest for that restriction, and two, that that restriction must be the least restrictive way that it can meet that compelling interest. So with that framework, let's take a look at the project that we have before you today. For a little context, here we are right here in the yellow box, here at the Vista Center. This project today involves Century Village. Century Village is a gated retirement community of over 7,500 units, making it larger than a dozen Palm Beach County cities. We're here today to talk about a site right here in the center, often referred to as the administrative building. Moving in a little closer, here's our site. It's 2.36 acres. The primary parcel is located north of Century Village, right here in the center of the community, and to the south is a small overflow parking area. Looking in a little closer, this is that location. Immediately to the left of it in the community is the main clubhouse. That's the recreational facility there across the lake to the west from our site and has the clubhouse and pools and the other affiliated recreation. And then here's the building before you. This, a building, this building was built in 1968. Get a little water. It was built in 1968 is referred to as the administration building that served the community as some form of offices. In 1994, this project came to the county with a request to convert to commercial use. This was a highly controversial request, um, went through many hearings and many review, but ultimately it was approved. It was approved with a couple important caveats. It was limited in the types of commercial that could be allowed in there. And two, it was limited to those retail uses to the members of the community itself, meaning it is only limited to Century Village. You cannot come into their gated community to participate in the commercial services that are offered there. With that said, there's now a pharmacy in there and a salon, doctor's offices, and it's become an important amenity to the community. What you're seeing here is the southern facade, which is really the primary commercial facade off Century Village. These two entryways at the bottom of your screen are where most of the daily activity occurs. This is where you arrive if you want to go to the, to the salon or the pharmacy. So my clients live in Century Village, as do many of their community here. They have homes there. And they saw that this commercial building had come up for sale. The building was a little tired, it needed some renovation, but it had thriving businesses in there. So they were interested in purchasing it, so they came to me to do some initial zoning due diligence. That's what I do. When they came to me, they said, we have a question for you, though. In the rear of this building, on the first floor, is some vacant space. Our community is in desperate need of a small synagogue gathering location for a couple reasons. One is we have it, this is a retirement elderly community, and as a orthodox community, we have to walk to service. In the Florida heat, that can be a challenge no matter what the distance, as you can all attest. Currently, many of the residents go across Haverhill to the east. That is a bit of a hike, and crossing Haverhill is a real challenge. It's undivided, it's five lanes, and it was a site of a tragic accident where a Century Village resident actually passed away trying to cross the road just in the last few years. So while some of the members of this congregation made the effort to get there, for many, it was an obstacle that was just too high to allow them to practice their faith. So I looked at it, pulled up the zoning code, looked at the underlying zoning, basic stuff. Turns out, Place of worship is a permitted use in the underlying zoning district, subject to D DR overview, staff review only. It's all it requires. Do you meet the standards? It's a permitted use. So this is great news. This is this is going to this is shouldn't be too big a problem. So we continued our due diligence, 
And then we gave staff a call because the next step is always good to talk to zoning staff. Look at the approvals in place and see what's there. When staff reviewed it, they realized that even though typically the idea of swapping out a permitted use for an existing conditional use is unremarkable. You just go in and do it. However, by the nature of how the wording of the condition of approval was, when the approval was initially done in 94 and subsequently amended in 09, it reads as if those commercial uses that they introduced were the only uses you could do in the building. That it seemed to cut off the possibility that other uses, even if they were permitted in your zoning district, would not be allowed. So because of that, staff said, we, you can move forward with this, but you're going to need a development order amendment to change that condition of approval. Just to make it clear that that use that would typically be a permitted use here can in fact go in there so that condition is clear that you're not prohibited from introducing that space. So we began that process with the staff. Began putting the design application together. Um, that application looks effectively like this. This is the location of that first floor vacant space. It's 3,600 square feet, 11% of the entire building, only 11% in the rear. Uh, it's limited. In our use, we've said from day one, still <coughs> limited to Century Village residents. These are community members that live there today, that own homes in this community and are looking for the opportunity to peaceably gather and worship their faith together. So the limitation remains, and we agree to that. This use only for residents that live in Century Village today. So we began work on it. As I said, this is that site. When we go into the actual floor plan, it looks like that. That's the location of the first floor. This going from permitted commercial to an institutional uh, place of worship land use is a decrease in intensity. Again, one of those things we look at is, oh, this is going to be easy. There's less traffic. There's less parking. And recall, on our high holy days, we're walking to service because that's our requirement in the tradition of this community. Here's that building. Again, looking at that commercial facade where most people access day to day. That little blue piece in the back is where the location is. Again, first floor only, 11% of the building. So while we began this process and we're having discussions, we, uh, the client said to me, one other thing. We have a, another issue that we struggle with in our community here at Century Village. In our tradition, men and women do not bathe together. And that extends to recreating in swimming pools. Because of that, what that means is the people that have moved here to Florida to enjoy their, the uh, recreation in the sun if a group of their, the women go to sit in one of the pools and it's empty and they're enjoying themselves, and any man arrives, they have to leave. It's awkward for them. It's awkward for the people that arrived. There's been a discussion in the community before. There are many pools throughout the community, both specific to some of the HOAs as well as some of the larger ones. There was some suggestion at one point, could there be some limited hours where it could be gender separated and that never went anywhere. So they said, Seth, would it be possible as an accessory to our place of worship to have two sw swimming pools on this site? And the answer to that comes down to two things always. One, zoning standpoint. Well, yes, you know, accessory uses to a, to a place of worship are not unusual. We just heard about daycare centers and schools and all of that. The recreation amenities is, is not unusual. So the second question became, the practical, can we fit them on the site? So we had our design team go to work, and this is what we came up with. Some of the criteria we had, one, we wanted them to be privacy shielded. We needed to have the space for them, even though they'd be modest in size, we want to meet the setback requirements. And because the synagogue location will have the changing rooms on the first floor and the, uh, and the other accessories as part of it, we wanted it to be located adjacent to that, which, you know, helpfully is located in the rear of the building away from everyone. 
So what you see there are the two swimming pools. To the north would be the women's swimming pool, and to the south, the men's. Uh, this is what that privacy screening would look like. Again, make sure that you know, attractively screened, <laughs> visually attractive, and from the outside, from the parking lot, that's what this looks like. Again, virtually no impact, uh, no visi limited visibility, um, limited use, typical accessory use. You know, within the community, obviously pools like this are not unusual. In proximity to buildings, residential centers, they're throughout the community. Um, this is not unusual in any way for the community. There was one question we had. We did have one variance on the north. That request was to allow the building to be located 24 feet from that northern property line instead of 30. We came in with that. We thought because of the screening, the landscape, there's a wall along the property line that it was, um, would be okay. Staff said they really couldn't support that. They said the only residential community near, like immediately adjacent to us, is on that north side. And they asked us to comply with that setback, so we've agreed to. So prior to final site plan review, we will either shrink that pool or resize it and bring it within that setback to eliminate that northern variance so it meets that separation requirement there. That brings us to the one variance we have left, and that's to the rear. This is just a function of the fact that the building's where it is. That rear, set, that rear yard is scaled certainly big enough for a pool and a pool deck, but it gets us within uh, eight feet of the property line. But again, here's what we're talking about location-wise. That setback variance that we're seeking, based on this existing configuration, is adjacent to a lake that's 300 feet wide, and on the other side, the recreation center's parking lot effectively. So again, from an impact standpoint of that variance, um, and virtually nothing, and again, even from that side, it would have that similar privacy screening. So with that said, we have WGI's, our project team, um, I'm going to ask the project planner who produced, who prepared all the application, everything's to come up and just briefly run through the zoning and variance criteria for me. Mr. Barnes. Good morning, commissioners. Matthew Barnes, senior project manager at WGI. Um, let's see. So, you know, you have two requests before you, uh, a development order amendment to the previously approved Class A conditional use to modify the use limitations to allow institutional and public facility uses and approve the site plan to convert, again, 11% of this building, 3,600 square feet. Um, and then also a type two variance to allow a reduction in the required width of the west side setback adjacent to the lake. The, the development order amendment will go on to the Board of County Commissioners. The final decision on the variance rests with the Zoning Commission. So, this is just a simple chart that uh, illustrates, you know, the, did the, did the thing go off? No, sorry. The, this is just a simple chart that um, illustrates that it's a eight foot, eight inch um, setback where 30 feet is required. Um, so it's a variance of 21 feet, four inches. And I'll go through each of the variance criteria just so you understand that we meet all the different criteria in the code. The first criteria is that special conditions and circumstances exist that are peculiar to the parcel of land, building, or structural that aren't ap applicable to other parcels. Um, you know, the, the existing building, it's important to note, um, does meet that side setback. The building is set back 33.2 feet from the west property line. So obviously that doesn't leave any room for uh, an accessory structure um, such as a pool to meet that setback. There's only 3.2 feet there. So it's, it would be physically impossible to locate a pool in that space and meet the setback. Um, it's important to note, as Seth did, that the, the nearest parcel to the west is over 300 feet away across the lake. Um, criteria number two. Special circumstances and conditions do not result from the actions of the applicant. Um, you know, this is, a, this is an infill, this is an adaptive reuse, I would say, not an infill, it's an adaptive reuse. Um, there's a limited amount of developable, developable area within the subject site due to the existing improvements. Criteria three, um, granting the variance shall not confer upon the applicant any special privilege 
denied by the plan and this code to other parcels of land in the same district. Um, as Seth laid out, this is a very unique parcel within Century Village. It's the only, you know, non-residential or commercial, uh, you know, zoned property. Criteria four, the literal interpretation enforcement and of the terms and provisions of the code would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other parcels of land in the same district and would work an undue hardship. Um, w typically when an applicant comes forward with an adaptive reuse such as this, it's always very difficult to adhere to the literal standards of the code because the code was uh, you know, maybe written for a different use, different uh, in a different time and era. So, um, applying the strict standards of the code in this instance would work an undue hardship. Criteria five: granting the variance is the minimum variance that will make possible the reasonable use of the parcel of land, building, or structure. Um, the reduced setback requests are only for the setbacks related to the accessory pools. It's not related to any new building any new vertical structure. Um, uh, it's, it's for the, it's an accessory use to the proposed place of worship, which is a permitted use. Um, there just isn't enough space on the site because it's an, again, it's an adaptive reuse to provide the pools and meet the setbacks due to the site constraints. Again, it's important to note that the nearest property to the west, which is where we're requesting the variance, is over 300 feet away across a lake. Criteria six, the granting the variance will be consistent with the goals, uh, objectives, and policies of this code. Yeah, this, this variance uh, request only relates to the setbacks. It will not jeopardize any compliance uh, or any consistency with the plan. Moving on to the development order amendment criteria. Um, first criteria is consist consistency with the plan. The proposed uh, development order amendment is minor in nature. As Seth mentioned, it's 11 percent of the, of the floor area. So that will not uh, jeopardize the subject site's um, determination to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Criteria B, consistency with the code. Um, the proposed use is consistent with the code. As Seth mentioned, it's permitted by right by DRO. Um, compatibility with surrounding uses. Uh, the subject site is part of Century Village and serves as its accessory commercial parcel. It has been found already to be compatible with the surrounding uses, and your staff has concurred on that. Um, criteria D, design minimizes adverse impacts. Um, the proposed structure is located internal to the pod, as Seth has illustrated on the prior slides. Uh, it's on the back side of the building. It's on the west side. Um, Therefore, it won't have any effect on the adjacent lands. Uh, we're providing the appropriate screening and buffering to the north, to the west, and to the east. And finally, the, the last four criteria, design minimizes environmental impact. There are no environmental issues associated with this application um, beyond what we have to comply with during the final site plan phase. Development patterns, it's currently developed. Um, proposed amendment will not jeopardize the development patterns of the subject site. It's simply an adaptive reuse. Excuse me, just one moment, please. We can hear you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, criteria G, adequate public facilities. Um, the proposed project does not uh, have an impact on concurrency. And then H, change conditions or circumstances. Um, as, as Seth has demonstrated, there is a demonstrated need for the place of worship use, and the proposed location here is ideal due to the proximity of the members who reside in Century Village and the difficulties it is to get across the street to the to Haver, across Haver Hill to the other place of worship. Thank you, Matt. Always important to have your actual planning expert go through those for the record. Um, as we said, staff recommends approval of this project, and I want to thank staff for all their hard work on this. Um, it's, um, like I said, it's a <coughs> unique project, if relatively small in scale. Um, I do want to make one point. The setback to the lake exists for both pools. The men's pool to the south is slightly closer to the lake than the women's pools, but that setback uh, variance exists for both of those swimming pools. 
for the women's pool that relates as much to making sure we preserve the parking on the site to the fullest extent possible. The site has always been adequately parked. It's never been an issue. Um, but nevertheless, we want to make sure that for the commercial uses that remain in the majority of the building, that that's available. Um, we uh, have uh, come full circle on this project. Um, when we started this, I made a brief comment about our LUPA. Uh, with that said, I want to just provide a couple quotes that the courts have used in looking at projects exactly like this. Improper denial of a site plan and variances for sanctuary, offices, library, kitchen, gymnasium, and classroom was, in, was improper. Plans approved with no further actions necessary. I point this out just to show that the courts treat these accessory uses as part of the community. We're not talking about simply a sanctuary. We're talking about the place of worship as a whole. In reaching Hearts International, the court said, the framers of the Constitution and Congress in their collective wisdom were cognizant of the power and tendency of a majority to marginalize and discriminate against an unfamiliar or unpopular minority. And that's something that this law is specifically intended to prevent. And then in Westchester, denial was pro improperly based upon undue deference to the opposition of a small group of neighbors. So I bring that up. With that said, during this process, I want to make it clear that we have reached out to Commissioner Weiss's staff. We, Commissioner Weiss, along with staff, hosted a Zoom information meeting for the entire community that we attended to make sure that everyone was aware of the project, the nature, what we were asking for, et cetera, and an opportunity to address uh, the community's concerns on that Zoom meeting. So we had that reach out. We met with the United Civic Organization, which is the organization that helps maintain the roads um, and some of the uh, common infrastructure throughout the entire community. We're not strictly part of UCO, but we met with their staff early on as well. Um, so that concludes my, my presentation of this project today. Um, I would like the opportunity to come back after public comment to address any questions that come up or any misinformation or anything that's inconsistent with what I've shared with you today. Um, with that said, I thank you and I'd be happy to also address any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, yep. Staff. Yes, can we hear from staff yes. first and then we can, thank you. Yes, I, uh, Wendy Hernandez for the record, so I'm going to also present um, this application and we'll see if that clicker works for me this time. <laughs> you can just hit. <laughs> Okay, so the request, um, as Seth has, um, Mr. Ben has already summarized, is at the northwest corner of Century Boulevard on East Drive. It has a high residential 18 future land use and a residential high zoning classification on 2.38 acres of land. Uh, the request before the board is the type two variance for the uh, side setback for the pools for both of them um, and the development order amendment which modifies the site plan adds uses and modifies conditions of approval the century village development um, was uh, started development in the late 60s and 70s it was pursuant to our 1957 zoning regulations at that time zoning did not have planned unit developments uh, planned unit developments didn't come in uh, to play until 1969 um, so I will slide it on. This is the aerial of the site, as Seth has already indicated, with the western side um, being the location of the pools, the, kind of the northeast corner closest to the lake, and the first floor of that far uh, parallel building to the lake being the location for the um, proposed place of worship or the modify of the use. This is the proposed site plan um, that includes the variance, uh, the development order amendment. It is 2.38 acres of land for this particular parcel as well as on the southern side where they have additional parking. Uh, 31,800 square feet is total approved. It isn't built totally. It has around 28,000 that is built, so there is a future phase for the additional to bring it up to the 31,800. Uh, there are the two pools that are proposed. 12 parking spaces and access is internal to the development um, from East and Century Boulevard. 
So at time of publication, um, we have received no letters of uh, responses, um, but we have met um, with residents, have had emails and phone calls um, since the time of the publication um, on the proposed request. We are recommending approval of both the variants subject to the condition in C1 for the setback um, on both pools and the recommendation of approval on the development order amendment. So. Let's see, the conditions that are proposed to be modified um, relate to the use limitations that were established in 1993 when the accessory commercial use was approved. Um, and this ultimately, this modification keeps the retail medical office, the office of business professional, the personal services, the financial institution in play and previously approved. And we've added in the condition or it's been included by the applicant to include institutional public and civic uses um, and they would be subject to the approval processes as required in the commercial neighborhood uh, zoning classification. You'll see adult daycare um, is part of that listed use that is part of an institutional use and was previously approved for the community. Again, this is the aerial for the required zoning, another aerial. And, um, and I think that ends my conclusion, unless Scott would like to add anything on. I would, thank you. Um, first of all, the, can you back up a couple slides to the condition? Just to point out, this was on the add delete. There's a slight modification to the, to the wording of it, but the intent and purpose remains the same. If uh, staff, would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Okay, back to the last slide. So, um, if you indulge me for a few moments or a few minutes, uh, the applicant did briefly touch on our lupa, which is a very complex and nuanced area of law. Um, it deserves a full day seminar, but I'm going to try to distill it down into um, you know just a few minutes. Uh, so our LUIPA is a, uh, a federal law that provides protections and safeguards for religious institutions as it relates to land use regulations. It's not a blanket exemption from zoning laws, but it does prohibit a local government from imposing uh, uh, unduly burdensome or discriminatory uh, uh, decisions on uh, religious institutions. So if you look at the slide, um, these are the provisions under our LUPA. There's four main protections, and we'll focus on the first two because those are the two most likely to be implicated by today's decision. Um, and uh, there is a lot of case law in this statute, but it's all very case-specific and fact-sensitive. Again, very nuanced. Um, and it's also important to note that those two provisions are mutually exclusive. They operate independently of, an, of one another, so they could both be violated, one could be violated, or none could be violated. So the first one we'll look at is equal terms, and that's the second one, second bullet point up there. And as you can see, it states that uh, no government shall impose or implement a land use regulation in a manner that treats a religious assembly or institution on less than equal terms with a non-religious assembly or institution. For cases in the 11th Circuit Court, which we are a part of, um, the terms assembly and institution are given their normal dictionary meanings. So an assembly is a company of persons collected together in one place and usually for some common purpose. So it's a very broad category. An institution is more formal. It's an established society or corporation, an establishment or foundation, especially of a public character. Some examples of uh, uses that may be considered non-religious assembly or institution are private clubs and lodges, parks, recreational facilities, meeting halls, civic centers, schools, theaters. And we also have in the ULDC uh, a couple categories that specifically call out assembly uses which would probably qualify under this um, concept. So in the context of the development order amendment in which you are determining whether to prohibit or allow the place of worship as a permitted use, it's important to look at what other uses are allowed on the property for purposes of this equal terms provision. Uh, there is no, it's my understanding, and I think staff just confirmed that, that adult daycare is currently allowed on the property. There's no case directly on point, but case law does suggest that uh, daycare could be considered a non-religious uh, assembly for purposes of our LUPA. So if a court determined that that provision was violated, um, it would be subject to what we call strict scrutiny, which uh, the applicant touched on briefly, which is a very high legal threshold and standard. The government would have to prove that the, um, in this case, prohibition of, of the use was um, 
in furtherance of a compelling governmental interest and narrowly tailored to meet that governmental interest. Again, a very high standard to meet. And the second provision that we'll talk about is the substantial burdens provision. Uh, as you can see, it says that um, no government shall impose or implement a land use regulation in a manner that imposes a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a person, including a religious assembly or institution, unless the government demonstrates that imposition of the burden on that person, assembly, or institution is in furtherance of a compelling governmental interest and is the least restrictive means of furthering that compelling governmental interest. So. Uh, Again, just like with the equal terms provision, uh, if a court determined this provision was violated, the county would have to meet this very high, strict legal threshold called strict scrutiny. So the si substantial burden test, I think, could be implicated by both the variance and the development order amendment. The 11th Circuit has some helpful definitions and interpretations of what substantial burden means. Um, a substantial burden must place more than an inconvenience on religious exercise. A substantial burden is akin to significant pressure which directly coerces the religious <laughs> adherent to conform his or her behavior accordingly. Thus, a substantial burden can result from pressures that force assemblies to forego their religious beliefs. Uh, case law has indicated that denying or prohibiting a religious use in and of itself is not necessarily a substantial burden, but context is really key. Uh, it's important to note um, their current location for religious exercise and what options they may have other than moving to this specific new location. Uh, for substantial burden, one factor courts may look at is whether the current location provides an opportunity for the applicant to conduct their religious exercise, even if it's not as convenient or preferable as they'd like. So what are the problems they're trying to cure by moving to this new location? And are these or could these problems already be cured by their current location? Um, even if it's not the most convenient or, or preferable. Uh, another factor courts may look at is whether there are alternative locations available for the place of, to wor a place of worship to move to, perhaps um, nearby districts or locations where a place of worship is a permitted use as opposed to here where it's not currently permitted. Again, even if that alternative location isn't necessarily the most convenient or affordable or preferable. Uh, for example, if there are other locations that meet their needs, but it's simply a matter of cost or convenience, um, th that may not be a substantial burden for relief. These are just some of many factors that courts across the country, and in including the 11th Circuit, uh, may consider in determining whether or not a, a burden imposed by your decision is substantial or something less than substantial. Um, and again, in the substantial burdens, test, if a court were to determine that there is a substantial burden, the county would have to demonstrate that they meet that strict scrutiny high legal standard, that there's a compelling governmental interest being furthered, and that it's the least restrictive means of achieving that governmental interest. So um, that's just a little bit of background on Arlupa. Like I said, it's, it, it, it could be a whole treatise on it. Um, but I also wanted to point out that above and beyond Arlupa, you still have your normal county standards of approval that you have to consider for the development order amendment and the variance. Um, staff is recommending approval, so the only way that you could deny, or if, if you wanted to deny the applications, would be as if you could determine that there was competent substantial evidence elsewhere on the record to support a finding that one or more of those standards of approval haven't been met. So that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, as you you, know, you said, yeah, it is a uh, you know it's a it's it, it, it's a tricky you know road to navigate. But we do we will as we usually do consider everything you know the you know that we have to look at regarding zoning and all of the above. But thank you. Um, all right. We have some onto the cards. Onto the public. Under the public comment cards, yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so for the record, Madam Commissioner and fellow Commissioners, we have 79 cards that were submitted that do not wish to speak that are all in support of the uh, item. We have an additional 63 cards with comments that are in support of the item that have been submitted for the record. Sorry, go ahead, ma'am. Okay. We have 15 cards that have been submitted in opposition that do not wish to speak. And then we have the remaining cards of both support and opposition that do wish to speak that we'll call at this time. When we call your name, please come up to one of the two podiums. Please remember you have a two minute timer to speak. The timer is located to my left, your right. 
make sure that um, you know we try to remain quiet so everyone's comments can be heard and respected. Thank you. So I'm going to call up, and I apologize if I pronounce names incorrectly. Uh, Richard Handelsman, please come up to the first podium. And John McCoy, McMoy, please come up to the other podium. Please state your name and address for the record. John Malloy, Stratford B. I'm here today representing Stratford A, which is the building right out behind the parking lot <clears throat> where the medical building is located. <clears throat> they had a vote, and they are against the swimming pools going into their, right in front of their buildings. <clears throat> These people also worship at the synagogue, so there's no discrimination here. They did not want two pools in front of their buildings. <clears throat> also, this presents a, a problem to the, the parking. These pools take up all the parking spaces that are there. We have staffing for the building uh, medical department there that works there. They park there. And now the people that come here to use the medical building also have to park there. And now there's limited spaces. Now that we're being told also that right next to uh, where this parking lot is, we have a, a water pumping station. The water pumping station supports a f quite a few associations. Stratford, East Hampton Association, Strasburg Association, Waltham, Century Village, the Medical Building, and Century Boulevard. This is all supported by the, the, uh, the water pumping station, which we're told has to be moved. This is going to be a quite an expense to move that and has taken some time to get everything under control there. Uh, everything else? It's just too much noise. The, the distance between the actual residence where these buildings are and the swimming pool is only a few feet. It's a small parking lot in front of the buildings and then a few feet and then we have the, a wood partition and then the parking lot. They feel that will be too much noise <clears throat> and too much activity there, and they don't want this here. So they oppose this, and they asked me to come in and make the vote that they are against this. It would cause more of a hazard for the residents of Century Village, <clears throat> especially the, the people have to use that medical building Thank for medical you, purposes. Thank you very much. Alice Roth, please come to the podium. Sir? Richard Handelsman. 166 Plymouth W. Uh, before you start the clock, do I have to say that I have been in contact with Niels Heimerich, Commissioner Weiss's staff member? No? No. All right. Uh, I see two issues here with the building. I have no objection. Uh, the uh, attorney in the Zoom has said there will be no changes to the commercial enterprises in either time nor duration. The parking lot and the swimming pools, however, I would offer a compromise. Politics and zoning are often the art of compromise. I would suggest one pool which would eliminate the need for moving the pump housing you could increase the buffering, fewer parking spaces. And with one pool, if I were there and the ladies wished to go in, I would just say, okay, I'm out, you can go in. And then they went after they left, I would go in. I think one pool would eliminate many of the objections that uh, are occurring here. There are five other pools in Century Village that are owned by the individual condominium associations that are available only to the members of that association. They are often very close, separated by only a chain link fence, which does not stop sight nor sound. So this pool would not be out of keeping with the neighborhood pools. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Alice Roth, please come to the podium. Samuel Cohen, please come to the other podium.
Do we have people in the overflow room, Wendy and Lisa? Ladies and gentlemen, please. Okay. Alan Roth to the podium. Yes, sir, go ahead. Good morning, my name is Samuel Koenig and I'm a resident of the state of Florida and Plymouth I'm on the board for over uh, 15 years. I've resided here I'm on the board for two years. Number one, I attended the meeting here 12 years ago. And as you can see, none of the things here interfere with anyone's lives, including the walls that are built all over for sound. The fact of the matter is that 15 years, 12 years ago in opposition, I listened to other board members when there were only four Orthodox Jews here. The neighborhood has changed. And at that meeting, and I will fast forward to now, members of other boards said to me, Hitler didn't kill enough of you. And other members said to me at the board, and I will fast forward to members now in my, in my association. Excuse me, can we please so that- Ladies and speak. gentlemen. Thank you. They said, go back to New York or go back to Israel. That was 12 years ago. The neighborhood has changed. Next, fast forward to now. Recently, I approved purchases for gay couples which couldn't buy because of technicalities of the Rules Association. I just approved purchase to a black couple from Cuba, 142R, and we don't discriminate. And members of, of, of my association came over to me and said, Sam, how do we keep these people out? And the answer is, we don't, we're Americans. And I can tell you that even the conservative synagogue, because the other synagogue is full, and I can't walk because of COVID, Many of our members now cannot walk after years and years because we have COVID in our legs, and most of these people live within one minute. And recently, the conservative synagogue was sold, and I offered double the price just for the community. And the answer was, no chassidim allowed as part of the, the giving it away. They're all dying, they're leaving. And they said, we don't want these people here. So I say to you, if they're in their rights, and they have 26, Thank you, sir. they're 26 schools. Thank you, sir. Your time is up. David Langer, please come to one podium. Jacob Frank to the other. Good Sir? morning. I'm Jacob Frankel, one of the board members of Kahal Hasidim. I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today and participating in this important meeting. I would also like to thank UCO for all the services they provide in the residents in the village. Before we purchased the property, we had a meeting with UCO together with my partner and Mr. Sad, our lawyer. At the meeting, we discussed two main reasons we wanted to purchase the property. The first one was to make a synagogue in a small area of the building so that elderly people don't have to walk far for prayers on Saturday. Because Saturday we can't drive and we can only walk. The second reason was because we want to build two pools so both men and women can go swimming as our religion, as we said before, doesn't allow us to swim together. UCO was aware of this problem we faced. Currently, as Sad said before, if women are swimming in a pool and men goes into the pool, the women will immediately leave the pool, causing both of them to be very uncomfortable. UCO understood the situation well, as they were very happy about this idea. Therefore, I would like to thank them for giving us the encouragement and support for buying this property. Since purchasing this property, we invested a lot of money enhancing the landscaping, the building, we changed doors. The property was very neglected and needed a lot of repairs. We still have some space to rent and we are looking for tenants who would benefit the entire Santry village. As we speak, we are re-signing now with one of the medical people, the tenants, we have a, a new year 10-year ten, uh, ten lease. And we're looking forward to working together with the whole community. And thanks again 
for everyone for coming and have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. Sir. My name is David Langer. I'm a snowbird and I live at 39 Plymouth E when I'm here in Florida. I came from New York just for one day to give the variants support. A little over a year ago, on the High Holy Day, as mentioned by the attorney, on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year of 2021, Barry Fishman, I'm going to get emotional, a Hasidic Jew who I knew was run over and killed instantly crossing Haverhill. The impact was so hard that his body was thrown hundreds of feet. By allowing this variance in the Walgreens building, who will allow people to be able to worship on the Sabbath and not have to cross the Haber Hill Road, which is like a major highway. As you can see, I'm not a Hasidic Jew. I don't dress Hasidic, but I support them to get this variance approved. This may save many lives by not having the senior citizens, some of them elderly, and many of them handicapped in wheelchairs, not to have to cross a major intersection. I ask you all to please approve. Thank you. Marie Fanina, Fatina, please come to one podium. And Michael Dausch, Dosh. Before my time begins, I had sent in through email the signed petitions of 760 people who were opposed. And I sent it to Donna, and she was not there, and it said to uh, forward it to her assistant. I did. I don't know if anybody's looked at it, but there's 760 signatures opposed. Would you like to submit those for the record, ma'am? I sent them. This is my only copy. I need these back if you're going to make copies of it because I forwarded it to them. We have somebody from. We'll take them, we'll scan them, and bring it back right back. That'll be fine. Madam Chair, motion to receive and file 760 60 petitions in opposition. Oppos yes, sir. Okay. Uh, motion made by Commissioner Kern, seconded by Commissioner Scarborough. All those in favor? Aye. Motion, uh, motion to receive and file 760 signed petitions in opposition of uh, item number seven. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, my name is Marie Farina. I live in Andover C. I'm right in front of the mic. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I am an, I am here speaking on opposition. The reason I have is, first of all, Century Village has embraced inclusiveness. There's already four temples or shoals, whatever you want to call them, in walking distance. There's one at ha um, outside of Hastings. There's one at Haver Hill, which has a traffic light so they can cross. There's two in condos. So that's four. So they're asking for a fifth one. This is supposed to be a community, and what you, they're trying to do is establish a community with a private environment. No one else will be able to use the pools. Nobody else is going to be a private little sector. And that is not correct. And by allowing the shul in the medical building or the administration building, they're going to allow guests. No one's going to stop them. They can have. 5, 10, 15, 20 of their guests that don't live in Century Village come through the gate to use their facilities. That's going to cause the people that live there to have to pay more for security, for guard that the gate is affecting our infrastructure, it's affecting transportation, and that's not fair to the people that currently live there. Um, 
and by ha the pools, anybody can use the pools. Somerset Pool, the ladies go there. They have it all morning, just about, and the other people come in the afternoon, so there's no need for extra pools. Ladies and gentlemen, please. It's not right to allow a, a community to form their own little entity within Century Village. There's all kind of different religions, and we all have to respect each other. And it's about time that they don't have their own special area. Thank you, ma'am. Michael? My name is Michael Doach. I reside in <clears throat> Stratford I Condominium. The question here it really is a, as the applicant put it, and most of my references are to the information I received from the county. We all know that the Century Village was built, started in the 60s. Many rules were in existence then that are not in existence now. They've been modified. Uh, later, they built a business facility to serve the residents of our community. It was a commercial development and it provided for commercial facilities. The pharmacy being one that most of the residents use and obviously they would not locate there unless they knew they could probably run a successful business based on the 8,000 residents in the village. The applicant also stated that the pools are needed for recreational use. Many of the pools in the community are restricted to the owners of the condominium and some are not. I don't know if this pool would be open to all members of Century Village or not. I wonder what the answer is. This is not a religious issue. This is a zoning issue created by this board. And what I would do is advocate the fact that this is a non-commercial use. This is why they are here, is to ask for a use that is institutional to put in a commercial facility. This particular use does not meet the needs of all of the members of Century Village. It only meets the needs of this congregation. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Point of order. Point of order. Could we have a, a repeat the motion to receive and file for the record? Yes. Can I get that motion once again, please? Motion to receive and file the 760 petitions in opposition of item 7. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Kern, seconded by Commissioner Scarborough. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Jean Berman, please come to the podium. Good morning. My name is Jean Berman. I live at 262 Northampton N in Century Village. Uh, I have lived in Century Village now for almost three years. My mother, who is not here today, has lived in Century Village for over 20 years. And what I would like to say is that I am in opposition to the swimming pools. I have no objection to uh, having a house of worship. That's fine. I, I don't object at all. I happen to be Jewish. I'm not a Hasid, but I am Jewish, and I see no reason why people can't worship. The reason why we have zoning is to handle the rights of people who own property and the other people around them. By taking away parking spaces, by putting in a pool that will be used by a small percentage of the population, you are affecting the other people who use that building, whether they work there or if they shop there, for example, like the Walgreens, 
the medical use, which is up on the second floor. I happen to be a customer of the Walgreens. I go there for prescriptions. My doctor is in the Kano Health, which is on the second floor. So I go there a number of times a year, not necessarily every week, but I, I, do, I do go there a lot. And if we drive over there, sometimes it's very hard to find parking now. And if something goes and puts in, takes away parking spaces, it's going to make it even more difficult for the people who use the building. And it may even result in people staying away from the building, in which case the businesses may move away or close. And how is that going to help the people of Century Village? I mean, the idea is this is a service center and putting in a recreational use for swimming pools is not an appropriate use of the space. So I would say please vote against the swimming pools. There's no problem with the religious use for uh, the synagogue. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Madam Commissioner, there is uh, an additional 11 cards that do not wish to speak. They were uh, just classified wrong in my piles here, uh, but that would like to have their comments read into record and the comments consist of uh, basic arguments of today, we are the uh, we are a community of many people, religious colors, not one uh, should be able to take over the community. Basic concepts. Eleven. Eleven additional to the others. Okay. Do we have any other cards of people that wish to speak? Not a public comment, no. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, so if, if Sorry. <laughs> at, this, at this time, I'd like to make motion because, as uh, Commissioner Kern stated, we have a number of cards of people that would like their comments submitted into record but did not wish to speak. Um, it's possible to, do I need to do one? Because there are separate. There are some that are in favor. There are some that are in opposition. But I'd like to make a motion to have those submitted. Uh all comment cards uh, and those with comments will be automatically included as part of the record. Whether they are read into the record is at your discretion. Okay. All right. So at this time, please, I'd like to make a motion to submit them into record. Uh, they're automatically included in the record. Okay. There's no motion. All right. Well, then I'm good. Okay. All right. Okay. So that concludes the public comment <coughs> segment. I'm going to open up to... Uh, at this point, uh, it would be appropriate for the applicant to have an opportunity to respond to staff and public comments. Okay. I didn't know that. Just very briefly, there's a couple items I want to address. Um, you know, the parking isn't before you today. Um, we've met the code requirements in working with staff. Um, and in fact, as part of this application, we went out during season and did, did parking counts and found that you know, even at the height of a in season day, we did counts every half hour. There was 61 cars in the parking lot, and we have over 120. So parking has, has never been an issue here. Um, though somebody mentioned a a, um, a irrigation pump, we are aware of that. We do not actually believe our site plan touches that, but if it does, we will address that um, and and take care of it at, at, at our own at our own site. Not an issue. Um, there was an issue. They did mention that they had gathered. 170 something signatures. Um, I don't want to get into it, but the petitions that were submitted had a list of things that included statements like, we don't want additional children in our community. This only serves the community. Um, these people aren't gonna pay taxes. It's a, there's a statement that this use won't pay taxes. Only 11% of the building is being used is still a commercial site. We'll still be paying taxes, et cetera. Um, you know, I've gathered you know, uh, you know, several hundred letters of support as well, but the reality is most of those signatures were based on some misinformation that we hope we've cleared up today. Um, and so we look forward to your support. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. I think the number was in excess of 700 and not just 100. And an opposition is an opposition, just to clarify. You know what I mean? And I know it runs the gamut sure. anytime. Uh, okay. That's, that's Understood. noted. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we, we good at this time to open up. Any comments? Go ahead, please. Yeah, for the applicant. Um, there, I just wanted to get clarification. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned that the, um, that it, it, the applicant wasn't a business. But in, in looking at the document in front of me, it, it does, in fact, indicate that, that it's an LLC, which that would be a business in Florida, right? It, correct. Absolutely. This was purchased as a, a business entity. You know, those, those rents and those long-term tenants that are, in are critical to the ownership of the building. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, just one other quick clarification from staff. 
the um, the type two uh, variance that was re recommended denial. That's just the setback for the lake. The variance that we had recommended denial on was the pool setback from the north property line, and the applicant has withdrawn that request to reduce the setback, um, and they're going to meet the 30-foot setback for the okay. pool. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Kaffer, do you have anything? I just had a couple things on clarification. Um, the discussion, uh, one gentleman had mentioned that the pool would take up some of the parking, and I was trying to understand that, so I don't know if you can explain how much parking that pool might take up or? Yeah, I believe there was um, that northern pool displaced approximately 11 parking spaces on the site. Um, you know, we, part of that setback from the lake was to minimize the impact to that parking field. Again, that's the very rear of the building. Um, and, you know, obviously there was that question of if there's no parking, it would impact the commercial. Obviously, we would never want to do that. Um, that value is important to the owners of the building. Um, but again, more importantly, staff's reviewed it and has agreed that our parking meets the code standards for this site. Okay. And um, just obviously, the owner can do what they'd like with the property, but my question was somebody had mentioned a compromise, and there was some discussion earlier about, I believe you mentioned it, is the pools that are in the community. I'm not suggesting that the, these folks use those pools, but if you had one pool and schedules were all, I'm sorry. If you had one pool um, and a schedule was maintained, would that be something that yeah, would we, be? We would prefer that not be the case. Obviously, the ability to enjoy the community and not have it restricted to certain hours, um, you know, there's a, obviously a significant investment here, um, an effort on their part, um, and you know, it's our belief that these, the impact of these pools is de minimis. Like we said, the only setback we're not meeting is from the open lake to the west. Um, we meet the parking standards, so um, we have done everything we can to minimize, and as staff said, work with them to eliminate the variance from the only adjacent residential site, you know, the location of the synagogues to the rear of the building. Um, so we feel like we've certainly met our burden to minimize any impacts to the community. Okay, thank you. I have a question for staff. Uh, the remaining variance three, that's part of the first motion, correct? Yes. Yes, so the, the first motion, the first motion, if you were to do one, it would be to adopt or deny a resolution approving a type two variance to <coughs> reduce the side setback subject to the conditions of approval indicated in exhibit C1. So the reduce the number of parking spaces goes away, reduce the side setback reduce the side step and eliminate the compatibility buffer goes away. And just to clarify, because I know staff, Wendy did just mention adopt or deny, just to reiterate, staff is recommending approval. Yeah. Correct, correct. Uh, you know, as far as uh, the applicant, I have no issues with, uh, with this application and I'm in support of it. Commissioner, do you have any? Oh. Um, are there existing pools at the location across Haverhill? There are, there are not. There are not. Not outdoor recreational pools, no. So they, they, they don't exist now. Do you, you want to make them I'm not familiar with the location? plans on that project, sir. I'm not, okay. I've not been working on it. I'm not <coughs> currently affiliated with that site. Okay. So then what do the residents do now if men and women want to share the same pool? We cannot hear. Uh, I don't know what you mean. They can, well, they can. You, you want two pools because the, on, on the, the men and women of, of this project can't share the same pool. Correct. So what do they do now? They, they are eliminated from that opportunity to recreate in their community. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Scarborough? How many total? I'm sorry. How many total units? Um, in Century Village? Uh, I don't know the exact number, perhaps staff, over 7,854. <laughs> <laughs> somebody Thank would you. know. <laughs> um, if only one pool was permitted, how many parking spaces would that give up? 
or how many parking spaces w would be gained if only one pool was built versus two? There's a, we are, the current site plan as proposed eliminates 11 spaces on the site. With, with both pools? With both pools, that's so correct. So if we only built so, so one of those. So if we only those. built one of those, could we gain some of those set, you know, spots back potentially? If we only eliminated the south pool, all those spaces would still go away. Um, but again, you know, I would, again, emphasize the point that the meets the code requirement for parking on this property. And our study showed that the parking is simply more than adequate by a field study, by all the review, and by your own code standards. So, um, you know, I know there's been some issues raised about that, but it's simply never been, in, I, my clients have owned this building now for over a year. They've cleaned it up, they've operated it, they've, you know, made improvements, as Mr. Frankel said, um, and parking simply never been an issue. Okay. Um, I actually, I, I think it's a great project. I do. Um, certainly much safer to stay within the village than it is to leave the village and cross Haverhill. <clears throat> I think it's a great amenity, and um, I believe it would probably increase the values. I would absolutely support this. Commissioner Caliendo? Same here. For the same reasons as Mr. Scarborough said. Commissioner Sauer? Um, I'm Excuse looking. Me. I'm looking at just uh, actually just the application, which is the variance for a pool setback, and I think it meets all the requirements uh, because it's up against the lake. So I'm all for a reduction, and whether it's one pool or two pools, to me it doesn't matter. Uh, only once you resolve the issue about the parking, then it doesn't matter. Um, it's all about the setback in regards to the lake, and I think it, I think it, um, it meets the requirements. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think it comes to sometimes a little bit of an understanding of the faith that people maybe aren't completely, you know, aware of. We do have pools that everybody had been using prior to these two pools, and it wasn't an issue with the current residents. So, you know, for myself, I'm in, I'm in favor. Any other questions or comments from fellow commissioners? Are we ready at this time to make a motion? Madam Chair, I'll move to adopt the resolution approving a type two variance to reduce the site setback subject to the conditions of approval as indicated in exhibit C1 and that the application meets requirements of, is that 2B, what is the ordinance number for variance? meets the requirements for a variance. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, I'd just like to thank, thank staff for their work on this one. Okay. Do we, more, we, need need the other we have more, oh, we have more motions. Yes. Sorry, I'm not gonna thank staff just yet. I was premature in thanking staff. <laughs> but don't, don't use the motion on the, um, the second, the motion. second motion on denial because that variance was um, withdrawn. Yeah, that was withdrawn. Okay. That was mm -hmm. withdrawn. So just the last one. Move okay. to recommend approval of a development order amendment to okay. reconfigure the site plan and modify the conditions of approval subject to the conditions of approval as indicated in Exhibit C2 as amended. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion made by Commissioner Scarborough, seconded by Commissioner Caliendo. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion, motion passes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. I appreciate your assistance today and time. Okay. All right. So that is the last item that we have on our agenda. Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. We are still in session. So if you're going to leave, could you do so quietly? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so that's the last item on the agenda. So you can turn it over. Uh, for comments. Okay. Move to adjourn. Mo motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Opposed? Oh, yeah. Okay. And I think this is the last one before we go. We have Thanksgiving, <laughs> correct? So happy yeah. and safe Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank yeah. All right. Everybody, and happy belated birthday to Ramsey. Aww. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>